Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome to the stage the star and director of The Secret Life of Walter Mitty, Mr. Ben Stiller. Thank you. I was saying to you outside when I saw you that it's, it's such a beautiful movie. I mean, it's, I mean, I've seen some of the comedies that Stuart Dryberg has photographed. He's never shot anything that looked like this before. Talk about the look. Uh, well, I felt like the look was um, dictated by the script, you know, that, that Steve Conrad wrote. And I feel like Steve was willing to uh, take a chance with the, with the movie because there had been other versions of remaking the original that uh, I'd read one version about eight or nine years ago. They were all sort of like trying to remake the original musical comedy, but without music in them. And Steve, I think, was you know bold enough to say, I'm just gonna sort of let that go. And I think he sort of returned to this idea of the tone of the short story. Which is somber and melancholic. Yeah, yeah. And it's kind of, you know, what I always got from the story was that sort of you, you, have, you feel the nobility of this regular guy because he's just living his ordinary life and, and he's just you know running errands with his wife, but inside he's this hero. And that's such an iconic idea. And there is a sadness and a sweetness about it. And Steve, I think, has always had that in his writing. He kind of writes about the regular guy and the, um, you know, the, um, the struggle of just sort of trying to get through life and uh, the people who are sort of like, who see everything but aren't seen. And uh, so, Visually, you know, so then he took this idea of Life Magazine. He, he came up with this idea of Life Magazine going out of business, and Walter being a guy who takes care of the of the photographs, and it dictated to me the visual style of the movie, just from the script. So many of the the shots look like photographs out of life. I was thinking there's a shot where you're in the helicopter going to the boat, and we see you in the chopper. That could be a, a, a double truck in the, a double like a spread in Life Magazine. Yeah, I mean, we, you know, we got inspired by all the imagery from life, and it was really exciting to be able to look at all their photo archives and, uh, and just really, you know, even the, the, the design of the offices, uh, the, life, the Time Life building in New York where we shot. We shot in a lobby there. We shot in the lobby, and then we, uh, we built the set that was, you know, the, the office floor. But, you know, that mid-century architecture, that period in New York, uh, those skyscrapers that went up at that period of time, I grew up in New York. I, I, I felt a connection with that and somehow to the original short story, uh, even though you know, it was written in the late 30s. But those stories, those Thurber stories and E.B. E. White, uh, his shorts, there's an E.B. White short story I always think about with this movie too uh, called, called The Second Tree from the Corner about a guy just like riding on the bus after going to his, um, his psychiatrist appointment. And it has a similar feeling to it. And, and it just somehow for me there was some sort of Weirdly, there was some connection in terms of the, the idea of the Life magazine offices and the connection that it had with the New Yorker, even though, you know, different magazines. And that just sort of, you know, dictated for me the idea of him being this sort of rigid, very angular, but I think kind of, you know, those offices are beautiful the way they're designed, but, um, you know, there's sort of this desaturated kind of, um, you know, sort of uh, rigid boxes that he's in that he then eventually breaks out of. and uh, and then, yeah, the imagery of, you know, National Geographic and, and all those, you know, stories like that where you had, I grew up wa looking at Life Magazine and, and National Geographic and American Cinematographer and all, you know, all these magazines where I would just devour them and, and you know, you, you see these places and, and this, this imagery and I, I felt like, you know, there's an opportunity to try to capture that. It's funny because there's like a, obviously there's been a lifetime of images stored in your head. You had a chance to get most of them up on the screen for this, didn't you? Yeah, I mean, it was it was fun, you know, to especially the life covers because that that was an opportunity to try to tell the story visually, in that it was like setting up, um, you know, these sort of uh, maybe you know, uh, subconscious uh, cues for Walter's fantasies. Um, so it was really fun. Jeff Mann, who's uh, the production designer, and I, he made this model of the set and then we had like all these little miniature life magazine covers and we created you know we created a bunch that didn't exist for all of them. yeah a lot of them for the storytelling purposes but then a bunch of them really do exist and um and then we would just like slip the 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 cover you know the covers into the little slots in the in the model and and see the different permutations and that you know that was really a, a, 
a fun process, and it was also kind of just, uh, you know, for us, it, it changed as we went along, too, because I, I think we, um, we didn't know how literal to be with the cues of, of what Walter has. It, originally, when we were developing the script, we, and the studio was kind of specific about this, about wanting to have, like, well, you know, he has to see um, an Arctic explorer before he would have the fantasy about being an Arctic explorer, or someone has to say something. And we ended up doing that a little bit, but eventually I, I realized that th that didn't really, I think on a conscious level, matter as much. But then it was fun to sort of try to figure out ways to do it subtly. I have to ask this to you, because I guess I never asked you this before, but just watching this movie makes literal. So many of the characters you play, I think, uh, you know, even Permanent Midnight, or Tropic Thunder, or even Night at the Museum, are characters who live in their head a lot. And the difference between what's in their head and the real world is re there's a real division. It's almost like your entire career has been building up to doing Walter Mitty. Um. <laughs> I, I think I have been living in my head a long time. <laughs> but you know, I mean, these characters have these sort of these lies that don't connect to anything, and often they're delusional. Delusional, yeah, that's me. <laughs> um. <laughs> that's not what yeah. I was saying. No, but no, know, I, I never saw that correlation. But you know, now you mention it. Um, uh, yeah, I guess so. You know, I, look, I definitely could identify with the character. For me, what I identified with is that I that thing when you're in life and you can't be that best version of yourself that you want to be. You know, I, you were doing the interview and you asked me a question and then, you know, tw 20 minutes after the interview, I'll come up with this great comeback to what you just said. We'll keep up with you. We can Thank do you. it from the car. Yeah, <laughs> if you just, one of the cameras could follow me around. Um, but that kind of thing, you know, that little moment that happens in the elevator in the beginning, th those things, I, I just, I totally identify with that. And I, f I felt like it was something that a lot of people could relate to this, this idea of who we are and who we want to be and the disconnect between how, that com how it comes out in the real world. And that theme in the movie, I thought, was you know, what Steve wanted to explore, the idea of Walter getting closer to being that guy who he was inside his head. And I thought it was interesting that in the fantasies, his fantasies are not him being somebody else necessarily, they're just him being better versions of himself. That's the real difference between the, the, uh, the original movie and this, is that th he's being him, that they're just the best version of himself. Yeah, or the more romantic version of himself, or, you know... Um, this is what the short story's about too, by the way. Yes, exactly. I mean, that, that, that's really, when you look at the short story, it's this guy who is, is seeing himself in, you know, in these, uh, you know, whether it's a surgeon or... Uh, the you know the um, fighter pilot whatever he's just you know he has this potential and that was another thing that Steve kept coming back to is the idea of a guy who has so much potential he's not a loser he's not um, a loner he's not an odd guy or anything like that he is a guy who's sort of on the bench waiting ready to go and he needs to sort of like unlock that key but, you know, we used to have an opening to the movie that I ended up cutting uh, a little sort of montage at the beginning of the movie that was sort of the you know sort of Walter's morning routine um, and it started out with him on this exercise bike in his apartment. And actually, like the first image, I like talking about this because I miss it. I cut it out of the movie. But like the first image was um, the, the LED screen on his exercise bike, which is like in the shape of a mountain. And he's like biking up this mountain, which, you know, eventually he ends up going up this mountain. And, uh, but it's him just on this exercise bike. And what it was, is just I thought it showed him as a guy who like, you know, took care of himself and was ready to go, but wasn't, you know, was having a real life, but he's on the fake bike. And it's, you know, that, that idea is, to me, it's, it's very important that he's not somebody who's sort of, you know, uh, odd or weird. He's just a guy, like a lot of people, who, you know, isn't quite the full version of what he wanted to be. Why did you take that out? Um, you know, throughout editing the movie, I was really um, having to balance the pacing of the movie. Um, and I felt that ultimately... It was like a nice, maybe, you know, kind of artful little sequence that was maybe too, too much of that. And like sort of like... Too self-conscious? I think Stuart Kornfeld, my producing partner, said something like it was like celebrating the movie too much or something. You know, like it was kind of... Oh, we, the movie hadn't even started and we were saying like it was a little bit too, yeah, um, kind of uh, m maybe just making too much of a point of like showing uh, where this guy is. Actually, m probably ultimately the reason I cut it was... Uh, because it it made him feel a little more lonely um, than I, than I wanted him to feel in the beginning. 
Well, I and think... also the movie's about a guy who's just trying to get through everyday life. So to open with a guy like just trying to balance his checkbook is more kind of to the point. And it's also what Steve wrote in the script. You know, I came up with this whole sequence. We shot it and sort of fell in love with it. And then ultimately, like, I ended up cutting it. And then I, like, went and looked back at the draft of the script. It's like, oh, yeah, that's actually what Steve wrote. I started, you know, <laughs> just... He was right. You know. But also starting with the checkbook is almost like he's living in the period of Life Magazine at its peak. Yeah. I mean, I don't think many people still write in the checkbook anymore. Yeah, no, there's a guy who works at the office of our, our production company who's in his 20s who, like, I showed him the movie and he's like, dude, what's the deal with the checkbook? <laughs> and I was like, what? It's like, it goes, I think it's hilarious. The guy's using a checkbook. <laughs> and I was like, really? I didn't, you know. Um, but people, st some people still use checkbooks. Okay, I'm sure they are somewhere, <laughs> and they will love this movie for that very reason. Well, I have to ask you about... <laughs> I, I think, too, though, getting rid of that sequence, it's better to see him jump into stuff instead of seeing he's already physically prepared, so there's a little bit of surprise in that. Yeah, and also, there was a thing where intentionally, like, I wanted it to feel that he's, like, sort of this analog guy that's living in this digital world, and there's a... Tra and I do feel like that. You know, I feel like I'm of a generation where we're going through that, you know, where we can remember very clearly a time when there was none of this stuff. And because I really, for me, I was surprised when he said people don't use check, like I, to me that's just part, you know, the same thing with, you know, pre-computers and pre-cell phones. And, you know, that's very unique to our generation. And I feel that um, that's what, you know, Walter is living in a, and, and that felt, also I wanted to give the movie a, like a, s a kind of hopefully like a little bit of a, not, not timelessness, but just put him in uh, this sort of reality that wasn't necessarily exactly right now. Um, but yeah, I think it does live in that kind of weird, that, that world, because even the very beginning of the movie, the, a lot of the shots from that elevator are almost kind of two-dimensional. They're a little flat, and as he gets out into the world, the whole world kind of, the, the, the movie fills in behind him. I mean, that's a really great kind of visual motif. Yeah, and that was, again, that was just in the script, really, the idea of you know, that he breaks out of this thing. So, you know, it was very simple, like a simple idea to follow for us visually to try to just create that, not have much camera movement and only have the, the you know, the freedom happen when he goes into his fantasy world and then eventually it happens in his real life too. I have to tell you, I really sort of, there's so many great performances in this movie and, and uh, just Olafur Olsen, who I've seen in 101 Reykjavik and just, that voice that comes in the room before he does. That voice is 10 years older than he is, as a matter of fact. He has an incredible voice. This guy is an incredible actor. Uh, the guy who played the helicopter pilot. Um, he, uh, he came in and he auditioned. I went, you know, Iceland has a lot of really great actors. For great movies. Great movies, great actors great for music. a very, very small, great music. I mean, uh, of Monsters and Men, whose songs in the movie are from Iceland and um, uh, of course, Sigur Ross, and uh, it's, you know, there's 600,000 people in the whole country, and there's, like, all these great actors and great, great creative people. I think part of that's because it's a very, you know, it's dark for, like, you know, 10 months out of the year, <laughs> and uh, they're just, like, huddled up, and they're, you know, being geniuses, but uh, <laughs> it's, um, it's a great, it's, you know, there's, and there's just a very special energy in that place. And so, so Dari Olafar, his name is his short, you know, his nickname's Dari, Dari Olafson. He came in in the audition, and I was just like, wow, this guy's really good. Um, and he has this incredible voice, and he has this incredibly sweet quality. And we, and I was so happy to work with him. He's one of the first people that I cast. And then, then we ended up casting, you know, basically all, anybody who you see in Greenland or Iceland, we cast out of Iceland, except for, the uh, the guy who's the clerk at the rental car place, Mario, who is Greenlandic and uh, just came over from Greenland to do that. It's the, but also what's interesting too is how much quiet there is in the movie and how sort of somber it is in tone. I mean, it's because I just think about that as sort of compared. I don't want to use the word hysteria of the original, but the over exuberance of the original is like you were really making a movie to work as kind of a bookend to that, weren't you? Maybe I didn't. I didn't study the original a lot because I didn't intentionally. I didn't want to. Kind of pop in your head a little bit when you think about it, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's but it's a different genre. I almost feel it's you know it's, that's a musical comedy, and it's uh, you know he's in that movie that he's doing stuff that just I couldn't ever approach doing as an actor. It's just so well done that I I didn't. That's what what I liked about Steve's script was it really was saying you know what we're not even attempting in any way to recreate this. Um, but in terms of that, you know, that was something that in terms of the quiet or, you know, the, the vibe or the pace of the movie, that was something that I, you know, 
continually worked on, you know, we, we did with, you know. Because even in the middle of that fight, they're not shouting. I mean, it's, it's really scary, but nobody's right. screaming during that fight in the bar. Right, yeah. No, well, I mean, uh, all of it sort of just felt like the, the movie's tone to me, you know, it, 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 it was, it just sort of it evolved. Uh, you know, we're, I wasn't thinking about that when we were doing it. Yeah, no, I mean, I felt like, you know, I felt like it was so clear to me in what Steve wrote in his first draft, the work that we did together in, in developing it was really about trying, for me, trying to figure out the, the reality level of it, but the tone that he established and what he wrote was just jumped off the page to me in, in, in that way, where it had both those things, which reminded me of the original short story, too. I was telling you, even another line from the story comes to mind for the Ted character, the character that Adam Scott plays, where Walter says, they're so damn cocky, those guys, they think they know everything. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, that's, you know, I, I think that that stuff sort of happened just almost unconsciously, really. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, Steve and I never had a conversation about the short story once. Um, and I don't know how much he, you know, how, how much he referenced it or not, but I, you know, my, my feeling is he, he didn't do it that much because he sort of has his own process where how he, you know, how he um, approaches things. I have to say, too, uh, I have to ask you about the Benjamin Button sequence where you look like a combination of Benjamin Button and Gandhi as you've gotten older. That's pretty wonderful. Where <laughs> talk about that a little bit. What would you like me to talk about? <laughs> just, des um, just designing that, I mean. Well, it was, you know, we had this great model, which is Benjamin Buttons, you know, and they, they did that, just he did this incredible, I, you know, that movie, just like the makeup, and it's just insane. So we were trying to figure out a way the, to show Walter having, I said to Steve, like, it would really be great to show Walter having a fantasy about spending his whole life with Cheryl having this romantic fantasy about seeing how their life unfolds. And, um, and I remembered in Amelie, there's a great sequence in Amelie where he just like, you see this like super fast sequence of like the whole story happening, you know, he tells the story. And I said, well, we can't do that, but you know, maybe we can do some, and Steve came up, came back with Benjamin Buttons. And you know, I, and the idea that Walter did, d didn't quite, hadn't quite seen the movie, so he didn't quite know the rules. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, it was, you know, we didn't want to do, it was the only, I think it's, you know, we didn't want to have a lot of fantasies that related just to, to pop culture. But for me, it felt like it was, you know, relevant because this would be in his head in that way. And, um, and it always was one they were going like, does this, you know, I wasn't, I'm still not sure if it even fits in the movie, but it, it, it was. Really? Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I felt like it, I, but I, I felt like I wanted it to be part of the movie because it just made me laugh and we enjoyed doing it and, um, <laughs> We paid for the makeup guy. <laughs> well, I mean, that's the one thing that's really kind of big and comedic. Oh, hello, baby. I mean, not like you're like a baby, just like this weird little baby man, but it's... Well, that's to me like a perfect example of Kristen Wiig's, you know, comedic genius where she just, you know, that's pure delivery and her not doing something big, but it's being so funny in that way. And it was great to have Kristen in the film because I really think she's a great actress just you know just straight actress um who ha always has that sensibility and can go you know you say hey let's just like you know heighten this a little bit or go you know let's try to make it a little funny or and she just can you know temper it so it just incrementally she has that kind of control yeah yeah and because her natural base level is wanting to just be real and then she has this insane other side to her but it's like she does everything in between too She's also, in terms, in performance terms, a really great sort of balance to Walter, too. I mean, because she's just as quiet, but she's all like common sense, and her eyes are wide open all the time. Even the way you shoot her, we're aware of her eyes, just that they seem to be taking in everything. Yeah, well, she listens, you know, she listens as an actress, and she just, and which is great, um, you know, it helps. <laughs> when, um, you know, she, uh, it was important to me to have somebody that you, you know, there's very little time in the movie to establish the relationship between these two people, and it's not even a relationship because they don't, you know, they don't have a relationship. So, you know, and it's only the first part of the movie that you can establish that, and then Walter goes off and leaves her. So, it was really important to me to cast someone who the audience could invest in and would have. I, I felt you just have this, you know, sort of already likes her and and got her sense of humor, and I feel that like even when I screen the movie and I see, you know he's reading the um the computer screen 
and her responses. Um, I wasn't here for this part of the screen, but usually it gets like little laughs when you know she you read the responses that she she's written. You're just reading them because I think I feel like the audience is imagining Kristen saying that, and so off the bat she's like getting laughs and she's not even on screen and she's you know but you like her and you know and it's, and to me that was a that was a very important thing because these few scenes we had together you had to hope that these two people would get together. But the casting is so great, too. I mean, everybody sort of takes the movie in a different direction. I mean, when Patton shows up, I was just surprised because I just thought he's going to be an off-screen voice and just have them these, this welcoming presence. This guy literally saying, welcome home, is just kind of wonderful. Yeah, I mean, I love that in, in the script. You know, I love that the idea that this guy, you know, it was just such an interesting character. And, and again, it was in Steve's script that he, you know, that this eHarmony guy right off the bat was really curious about Walter, you know? And he was kind of just like interested in like what was going on with him. And trying to, to direct him his life. Really. Yeah, he was like a good guy. He was trying to help him get hooked up. And, you know, he, he, wanted, <laughs> he wanted to make it happen. And, um, and weirdly, like, you know, even, you know, kind of like asked maybe a few too many questions. <laughs> uh, originally, you know, in the first draft, we had more questions and stuff. Then it got like sort of honed down. But, uh, you know, I, I, I just, that was just like one of those things where to me it was like sort of this human aspect of the script that uh, was very unique and... It's really nice to to feel that you know when when the audience sees Patton and that you know that this guy showed up for him and it's just it's just an, I, I love that moment because again it's just like you know this is sort of built up this sort of goodwill to this guy and um, yeah so yeah I think it's what's funny too is the idea of like the the most masculine photographer on the planet has to be played by Sean Penn I mean it's kind of perfect did you know you always wanted him for it Yeah I think um, I think. We did, you know, S Steve called him Sean in the script, and <laughs> that was the first cue. Um, uh, and, you know, I think Sean represents, uh, he represents, to me, he represents integrity as an actor, and he represents integrity as a person. And, he and as an artist. Yes, a a for sure. And, uh, you know, again, it's, this is an important element of the movie where this character, I felt, you know, for leading up to meeting this character, he better be somebody that you want to see, and uh, he better be that g the guy. Because I knew, I knew, you know, having you know, some making the movie, I knew this is a five-page, six-page scene of two guys talking. That the whole thing like leads up to just these two guys talking, and you know, very few actors I think that just have the sort of um, you know the gravitas or the just sort of and the humor too that Sean has, um, in that his instinct had a approach that scene which you know I didn't know honestly because I know Sean a little bit over the years but we never worked together and I didn't know when he showed up in Iceland when we were shooting uh, how he was going to approach the scene and like secretly I was like hoping that he was going to do it like that but <laughs> wait you're the director can't you tell him how to do it a little bit well it's Sean Penn first of all <laughs> I'm Ben Stiller you're Ben Stiller come on yeah, for sex Stiller, first of all you're Ben Stiller Penn. But I, no, you know, I, I, you know I, I didn't know how much I'd have to, like I didn't know sometimes, first of all, he is a really great comedic actor, he's Spicoli. Uh -huh. um, but, it, you know, he had, but I didn't know if he'd come at it with a more comedic, like, you know, hey, this like, is a comedy, right? And he so wasn't ever thinking that way. A lot of times I think serious actors can sometimes have a different attitude towards, towards what was quote unquote a comedy. Because at that point, he, you know, nobody had seen what the tone of the movie was. I think we knew what the tone is. But he totally, you know, he was so like that's what he came with, and yet that to me that subtle sort of sense of you know humor that he has within it um, was uh, you know just very you know that couldn't I couldn't have imagined anybody better playing it. You mentioned Spicoli though, but Spicoli's a real character. He's not a caricature or anything. He's a person, right. yeah. and and those same kind of instincts served him well here too, didn't they? Yeah, for sure. I mean, look, anytime you're working with a a good actor. They're in, it's all about their instincts and choices, and um, you know that level of, of an actor for me. When you're, you know, you always, I always listen to what where they're coming from, even if it's not where I think, it, where I expected it to be coming from. Even if if he did come in with a different point of view, you know, I would I would take that in because you know there's always something to get out of somebody whose you know instincts have taken them to where they are and the work that they've done. And you have to respect that. Well, and the interesting thing about that character, too, especially the way Sean plays it, is he's kind of like the version of Walter that he would be if he got out of his, out of his head a little bit, because he lives 
an adventurous life, but it's an analog life too. I mean, he's off the grid in the same way Walter is. Yeah, and there's a connection between them. You know, he's he, Walter's taken care of his photographs for years, and they, you know, you know, he sent him that wallet, and um, you know, there's a respect there. I think he's like the one guy that gets Walter. You know, he's the one guy who sees Walter, and uh, but yet, you know, what I liked about how Steve wrote the scene too was that it wasn't like there was any trick to it. It wasn't like oh, he, you know. Uh, uh, you know, a, a writer friend of mine said, you know, I, I thought maybe it was going to be that, like, he had lured him out to Afghanistan to get him to have this adventure, and that would, he would have felt, you know, that would have been, like, a forced thing, or, you know, that he had, like, yeah, this guy was really just doing his thing, and he sent him the, you know, photograph, and he was trying to be cute, and, you know, whatever, but, he, you know, it wasn't like there was any plan behind it, and, uh, but yet then, you know, what the interchange that happens between them, to me, was just so, it, it, a simple idea um, of sort of, you know, Hey, you know, I'm being in the moment and you know going to play soccer because that's fun. That to me, you know, w I thought that's again a great choice that Steve made. And I also like the idea too that Walter so in his head he can't really even see that this guy trusts him. You know that uh, he can't even see the relationship. I mean, w that then that plays out in the movie. Yeah, I mean, I think you know that's what the movie's about is Walter sort of getting out of his own head, and you know what we were talking about earlier, but like really. Walter trying, you know, be sort of becoming more a guy who's in his own, comfortable with his own skin, and uh, and that becomes less about sort of you know overthinking things and and sort of just like you know slowly becoming the guy who's actually in the moment. I can't not talk about your heroic skateboarding scene in this movie. I was terrified for you just watching that. What was? How did you guys stage that? Uh, well, we staged it. Uh, you know, we you're talking about going down the mountain in Iceland. Um, so we basically went down a mountain in Iceland on a skateboard, um, and I had this incredible uh, skateboarder named Brian Holden, who is an incredible down, downhill longboarder for the wide shots. And then for the shots of me skateboarding, it was me skateboarding going that fast, but we had a safety rig that was jerry-rigged by the... Um, by the uh, Tim Trella, who's our stunt coordinator, and they'd never really made one like this before. So it was like me on like a rig, like a wire that was coming off of a boom arm that was on the camera car in front of us that was filming, filming it. So if something happened, the arm would like jerk up and like pull me up off the board, which really wasn't that great because then you're just like hanging from a wire going 40 miles an hour <laughs> down a mountain in Iceland, which happened like twice, and it was like this is worse. Just let me, <laughs> let me crash. Let me, you know, um, it was really the most, it was the most dangerous thing we did in the movie for sure because it, it just, was, you know, there was just, it didn't, it wasn't, it was a weird thing. But, but, you know, and then the other thing was that Tim was, I had a couple moments with Tim where he was, he's like a, you know, a grizzled veteran and he, we got to this road and the road had this like hard uh, gravel on it. It wasn't, it wasn't smooth. And, I, and, and we started to shoot, and, he's like, and I said, well, what, what's going on with the gravel? He was like, that, that wasn't here when we scouted. That wasn't here when we scouted. <laughs> okay, and action, let's go. And basically, the, you know, it, it was, it was, we were just like doing it. We were just kind of doing it, and, 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 and you just get what you get. And that happened also in the helicopter, because the helicopter was this old 50-year-old helicopter that uh, Jeff Mann, our production designer, found that was the original uh, helicopter from Hawaii Five O. <laughs> so uh, it was great. It was incredible, and but it was not. It didn't have a lot of power, and the helicopter pilot comes saying, "I wish it had more power. I wish it had more power." And uh, <laughs> <laughs> we had to go like film over the water, and uh, everybody had these like safety suits on because you have to wear them over the cold water. And I couldn't wear a safety suit because I was in the costume, but I was like safetyed into the like on a strap into the helicopter. So that right before we're going to shoot, uh, Tim Trella comes up to me and he hands me a jackknife. And he goes, listen, if this baby goes down, it's going belly up. <laughs> you take your knife, you cut yourself out, you swim to the top. <laughs> All right, let's go. Let's do it. <laughs> and then the helicopter pilot looks back and says, I wish I had more power, man. All right, let's go. So I was right to feel scared for you in that yeah, shot when no, we but, see you yeah, in but the I, chopper. I wanted that in that, honestly, like, I mean, I didn't want that. But, th but I did want, I w it was very important to me to get as much real stuff in the movie as possible because that's 
that's what I felt would you know translate the best. And I, I feel like that's even like with visual effects and all that stuff, the more real elements you have, the, the better it looks. And as an actor, I wanted it because I wanted to have real stuff to react to because I'm I'm not that great an actor and I can't like you know like green screen act. I don't like green screen acting. I'm not good at that. Oh, really? Yeah, I like I just it just helps to be in a real place, you know. Because I think what. what even Walter's fantasies feel like analog fantasies. They could be the fantasies from a James Thurber short story, even. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, it all to me felt like, uh, you know, the, the fantasies they sort of developed as we went along. But I guess they all are sort of informed by my and Steve's and um, and Jeff Mann, the you know, production designer. All of our we're all sort of the same age-ish and have you know a lot of the same sort of probably you know visual references and histories, you know. But I have to ask you too about before we go about your family. You know, having Shirley MacLaine and Catherine Hahn, just these two interesting poles. Because just your scenes with her, I can imagine what your life was like, Walter's life was like rather when he was a punk, you know, and was really living life in that moment. And that's what's interesting too, because the short, it's the short story is so condensed, you can add a lot to it. Yeah. And just having the family fills in a lot of holes. Yeah. I mean, that was again, you know, Steve. I think you know was came up with this idea that, that Walter had a family and that he, you know, has always been there for the family. He's always sort of taken care and had a mother who really loved him and was supportive. Um, I think in the original movie, the mother's is sort of, you know, he's a, like, sort of a harsh character. Um, yeah. And his idea was like, you know, he said a mother and a father who actually really loved him. He lost his dad and his, he's, then he sort of like sort of took over and his mom is, you know, the one who said, I like that, that nifty mohawk, you know, she's, she was there for him. Uh, and he wants to take care of her, and he wants to come through for her. And that's, I think, you know, as opposed to a guy who's burdened with life's um, responsibilities, he's just like a guy who wants to do the right thing, you know, a, and wants to be there. And, you know, his sister is a little whatever, you know, wrapped up in her own thing. There was a storyline that we ended up cutting out that his sister really starts to see Walter for the first time. And I had to just sort of, again, for, you know, for pacing, and sort of focusing the story, I, there's a scene that's really good. The Catherine Hahn, who I'm a big fan of, um, ever since uh, actually I saw Catherine and Adam Scott uh, in Step Brothers, and I was just like I got obsessed with that movie. And uh, <laughs> both, I mean, they're both so funny in that movie. Um, and uh, so Catherine meets Walter when he comes back from the airport from Iceland, and he's all torn up from the shark fight and they go to the impound lot because she was in charge of the piano and the piano got towed. And so they have, to get the, they have to get the piano from an impound lot and she looks at him, she goes like, what happened to you? And he says, I, I got into this you know, like a fight with a shark and whatever, it was for work. And she's like, you got into a shark fight? And uh, he's like, yeah, but I'm okay, um, whatever. And, and then she sort of sees for the first time that he's kind of, wow, he's like doing stuff. And, um, and she says, you know what, I'll take care of this. I got this. Go do whatever you have to do. And it's like this little subtle shift in her that sort of, you know, was a, a little bit of progression for her character. And, and unfortunately, I just, you know, the, the movie couldn't bear it. But, uh, you know, that, that, that family dynamic, I think, was an important part of the whole thing. Well, it sounds like what you're saying is you want the audience to discover these things instead of having these characters spell it out on screen. Uh, yeah, I mean, I would hope, you know, I would hope it's... I, the tone of this movie, to me, there's a lot of things that happen that... I felt were contributed to by investing in the characters. So like getting a sense of his mom, you know, that you get a sense of her from the beginning that you would feel like when she does produce the wallet that you could understand why she would have saved his wallet by not having a lot of screen time on with her before. Um, you know, things like that to me were, it was very, to pull those kinds of things off, I felt was a challenge and it needed as much help in terms of, um, audiences investing in the characters and, and imbuing them with what, you know, what I think the, the right actors could bring to it. We're out of time. Let's thank Ben Stiller for being here tonight. Thank you. Thanks for coming. <laughs>